when I don't want to be. I never felt that way. Sometimes there are days when you just don't give God enough praise. Well, it's been one of those weeks for me. So we're going right to the Word of God, and I want God to get all the glory. Will you join me in a word of prayer? You need prayer. I need prayer. Right now, will you bow? Father God, in your own sovereign way, in your goodness and your grace, you decided to keep us on your day. You decided that trial wasn't going to take me out. You decided that the children had to leave me alone. You decided that I'm not going to through that dark night. Father, I am overjoyed just to be in your presence. I'm away today. So if you know that anything I say is in line with that which you have to do around us in the world of ministry, give me what I need to follow you. But nothing I say without your word is anointed. So I'm going to be a I can speak to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go back with me to the book of Joshua. We are in a very powerful passage today. And last week we started this. And I, oh, you should have saw some of the feedback we got from this message. And so we're going to read this text. And today I'm just going to read a few verses so I can continue and go on. So I'm going to pick up Joshua chapter 6. Seven, the Old Testament. If you're in the New Testament, go back to the Old Testament so you can be where we are. Joshua chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading at verse 7 down to verse 12. All right. Let's read. King James Version. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up now, view the country, and the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua, saying, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand go up and smite Ai. Let not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. So there went up other people, about three thousand men, and they fled before Ai. And the men of Ai smote them, about thirty and six men, for they chased them before the gates even unto Shabaron, and smote them into the going down, whereof the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua ripped his clothes, fell to the earth on his face. Before the ark of the Lord in the evening, he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. And Joshua cried unto the Lord, and asked, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou, uh, wherefore hast thou brought us, his people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall we say when Israel turneth their backs before the enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall go around and cut off your name from the earth. What will thou do unto thy great name? I like God's response. And the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! What will lies you on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. I'm continuing the thought that we started last week, part two, stop losing battles that you should win. That's right, my brothers and sisters, God, the Holy Spirit is saying closely, you ought to stop. Losing battles that you should 
win. I hope by now you know that there is nothing impossible with God. Even if you are just one of those part-time Christians, you know the kind that call on God when circumstances and things fall apart, but when life is good, we're not thinking about God. Even if you're one of those, you still call because you know God has power. And this power God has is so that we can learn how to rely on his sovereign Power. Even if you don't believe this, you have to know that all of your reading, I hate to be the one to tell you, reading and your praying and your shouting and your boasting of how long you've been saved is all wasted if you don't believe God has power to do anything. As a matter of fact, I put it in our vernacular. It says there ain't nothing God can't do. Anybody with me? And we need to understand that sovereign power of God so that we can understand this text. Let me, let me take you there, and then I'll go quickly into the text. First of all, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the power of God, I look at the New Testament, John chapter 6, when it talks about the feeding of the 5,000. Interestingly enough, Jesus had just come back from healing the man at the pool of Bethesda. You know the story, and as he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, he found himself with a crowd following him. At the end of chapter 5, all of the scribes and Pharisees, the text says the religious leaders, began to argue with them. But did you know it's a losing battle to take your finite mind and try to debate or argue with an infinite, all-knowing, intelligent God? So they lost the fight. As a matter of fact, chapter 6, Six starts up with the results of that debate. You know what it said? Sometime later, Jesus looked around, and there was a crowd following him. And Jesus noticed they were hungry. Brothers and sisters, God, I wish I could stop and tell you, Jesus noticed they were hungry. If you tuned in for my, let me get a word for me. I need a new revelation. I need you to fix this, fix my this, fix my life, fix my... If you don't ever think about anybody else, you're missing the best part of God. Because if you can act like Jesus and think about somebody else, God will cover you already with the blessing. Let's change somebody's a direction right now, I hope. And you understand that your GPS of salvation should be set on blessing somebody else's life. Look what Jesus did. He knew that they were hungry. He didn't send them away. He knows all of the disciples make them sit down and get them food. And when they sat down, he noticed that they were uh, there was about five thousand men. But all the disciples could find was a little lad with two fish and five loaves of bread. And interestingly enough, Jesus told them to sit down anyway. At you know, all the disciples said, "What is he getting ready to do?" He was getting ready to show them his power. When they were all seated, it says Jesus fed them all and had baskets left. Over. That's the kind of God we serve. He has enough power to bless you. If you got blessed by God, you ought to know there's some reserve waiting on you. Every now and then, you ought to dip into the reserve of the last blessing you got from God because my God never just gives enough. He always gives an overflow for us to walk in. Now, we might look at that and say, Jesus fed those 5,000. What a mighty God we serve. But can I tell you, that really is not true. The 5,000 is a bit of a misnomer. You know why? Because the text said there was 5,000 women. The Bible being set in a patriarchal driven society where women didn't count, they did not count the women or the children that were obviously out there following Jesus. How do we know that? Because this is just came to stay for a minute. If 5,000 women were there, we what about, if every, what about when they have from had wives? That's another 2,500. What about if those, the women had wives only had one child? That's another 25,000. So at least Jesus fed 10,000 people, probably more, with two fish and five loaves of bread, and had some left over. You want to tell me that God isn't powerful? You want to tell me that you don't think God can make something out of nothing? That's the kind of God we serve. And when I look down and I start thinking about other miracles that happened in Luke's Gospel chapter 4, in the early part he had just healed Peter's mother-in-law. And the Bible tells us after he healed Peter's mother-in-law that he went about and it says in verse 40 that they brought people unto him and he laid hands and, listen to the text, healed them 
all of all kinds of diseases. Matter of fact, his prayer was so powerful. We're still talking about the power of God so you can understand. His prayer was so powerful that the Bible tells us in verse 22, the, verse 42, the demons started howling. I'm only saying that because somebody who's plagued by an enemy right now ought to realize that the demons tremble at the name of Jesus. And all they're waiting on you to do, all God's waiting on you to use his name. And they started running from Jesus. Other miracles we can look at. How about the opening of the Red Sea? We think we know the miracle. But did you know that Jesus held open the Red Sea so that over 2.4 million Israelites can walk through? Can you figure how much time it takes for 2.4 million people to walk as the sea is open up in the air and yet it closed exactly at the right time on Pharaoh. How about Gideon taking 300 men to fight 135,000 Midianites and destroying and killing them? How about Sarah having a baby at 100 years old? God allowed a baby to come in her womb. Somehow God reignited her birth canal, reignited the cellular structure and the ability of her body to go back to when it was young just to produce. All I'm saying is, God has power. How do you say God and when I look at the companions of God, I think about this thing, I'm going to put it to the text. I'm going to talk about it. Have you ever thought about the companions? Just show us the sovereignty of the God that we serve. And the thing I like about the compound names, they come up because somebody has had an encounter, somebody in the Bible had an encounter with God, and the experience left them with an attribute of one of God's power, an attribute that tells you who God is. And here's the crazy thing about it. Every one of those attributes you and I can understand. You don't believe me? And you ought to go with me to Genesis chapter 22 and watch as God told Abraham to take Isaac, the promised seed that it took him over 20 years to get, and to sacrifice him. And when God told him to do that, come on, stay with me. Abraham somehow went forward with his child. What I like about it is Abraham knew in his mind that if God killed Isaac because it was a promise from God, God's going to replace that promise. Can I stop there? If God promises something, if a dream in hell takes it, if you use it, if anybody uses it, you just got to use it. God said, if you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. If you trust him, you can get it back. And when he was about to lower the knife, the Bible said they had to call him twice. Abraham, Abraham. And when he did, Abraham looked over in the thicket. Verse 14 says that he saw a ram in the bush. God always makes the way. I don't have time now. I, I, I preached that before, but God always has a ram waiting for you. And in the 14th verse, look what he said. Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. How many of you know, not just Abraham. God has provided for me. How many of us can say there was a time when I didn't have anything, but God let me hold on until something else came through? How many know that God provided my needs? He provided what I need. I don't even have to sit here and say, but many people realize that God provides so well that we depend on God to provide, and sometimes He outdoes us, take us to the place of our wildest dreams. Not only that, but Jehovah. Jireh shows his power. I don't worry about lack because i got a God who can provide. And then if you don't believe that, we can go just one more. Then I'm going to sit down here and show you how the power slips into Jericho. You also need to follow uh, Moses. Follow Moses as they're going through the wilderness in Exodus chapter 15. And by this time, they had been disgruntled. The children of Israel were following Moses. And then it said they came and they were hungry and they were thirsty and they were getting sick. And then Moses saw that there was some water. But when they walked up to the water, it was bitter. I got to tell you, sometimes, even if you're a child of God, life will get bitter. Can I get a witness? But bitter life can't stop the flow of God's love and power. What am I saying? A bitter life will be turned around by God. How do we know? Because God showed Moses a tree. Oh, I don't have time to keep stopping, but everything just blows up. No, the only thing is speaking to me this morning. God said, I can take the simplest thing that's sweet in your life and put the tree into the bitter water and it becomes sweet. God is telling me to tell somebody right now, don't worry about where it's coming from, how it's going to come, trust me now, and stop before you get it. It's going to take the bitter life to make it sweet. Because that's the kind of God.
God we serve. And when they did, the water became sweet. And here's what God did. He made a healing covenant with them. As they drank, the water healed them and they got stronger. And God told them in the 26th verse, I like this. He said, if you will follow my commandments, hearken unto my voice, do the statutes that I've told you, none of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians will I put on you. Here, God called himself. He said, because I am Jehovah Rapha, the God who healeth thee. I need somebody to know God has enough power to heal any time we need healing. And that same promise that he gave the Israelites was also translated to us in the new covenant by Jesus' birth. How do I know? Because Isaiah 53 and 5 says this, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon us, and by his strength I'm healed. And we have no church over here. I remember that the old folk didn't care what they would do. They knew the power of God because they put in the cell. He's the burning bearer. He's the heavy little spirit. He's the bridge of the troubled water. They said he's the one in the courtroom and the doctor in the, in the sick room. He's what they were saying. He's just back to Jesus. I don't know what they were saying about what I was doing, but I don't know what they were saying too. But he's a doctor saying he's done back to Jesus and just getting started. He's the one in the courtroom. He's the one in the courtroom that never lost a case. I could go on, but I got to stop here. Watch this, because the power of God we're talking about. I could talk about Jehovah Raha, Rohi, excuse me, the God, our shepherd. I could talk about uh, Jehovah Nisi, the God, our banner. I could talk about Jehovah Tzit Canoe, the God of our righteousness. Sometimes we don't know that one as well as the rest of them, but the Tzit Canoe means that God keeps us righteous. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but I need God to keep me righteous. What it means is when I'm messed up, the God, Jehovah Tzit Canoe, keeps me on track and says, you're still good to go. But no more power was demonstrated than what the, what the Israelites have just seen here in Jericho in our text. How do I know? Follow me in this text. It says in the text that they had just defeated one of the largest obstacles, one of the biggest threats in Canaan, the land they were promised. I like God because when he promises you something, he gives you the power to overcome every obstacle that would stop your promise. And he gave them a promise. He said that you just defeated Jericho, and you did it with just a shout and a praise. There's a whole lot of stuff in my, I don't know, I'm feeling somebody don't understand that laughter to do good like medicine. I'm looking at somebody looking at me, don't know sometimes why I am so excited, because I found out something, that God's joy and God's Joy is a healing. My praise that ignites God's joy changes my atmosphere and blesses me. Oh, I heard somebody say, that's right, because you're right. I mean, I know. But when God, when you start praising, things change. I don't know what's dark and dangerous, what's going on in my house, but I declare unto you that if you begin to praise it, things will change in the moment of this text. So here's what they did. They destroyed it, but then the text that I just read said they went out and were defeated by little, lowly AI. How is it that sometimes you can be so strong and defeat everything, and then other days you're so weak, you cry all day? How is it some days you walk around able to uh, handle every burden and deal with every problem, and, and you overcome a problem and it comes back and you fall apart? How is it? Here is why. God told me to tell you that it's not him. He wants to let you know as he spoke to the children of Israel, you got to stop losing battles that you should win. I said you should win. I said it again, you should win. But God said to me, and I started this last week, there are some battles you should have already overcome, have won by now. There are some promises you should have already received by now. There are some, uh, some contentment and peace you should always be walking in right now. There are some blessings that you should have secured by now. There are some things that you should have, oh, God said, I will give you the delight. If you delight in me, I will give you the desires of your heart. There's some desires that should have been set by now. You know God said, it's not me. I'm telling you that God is not you got to stop losing battles that you should win. And I shared with you last week that God made us winners. He created us to win. Please remember that. God created us to win. Every now and then when I feel myself slipping, I remember that God created us to win. He created us to win. And then today I want to 
but just to reinforce that by saying not only were we created to win, not only should we start winning battles that we're losing, he said not only were you created to win, but I have all power. If we have this God of all power, if he created us to win, then why aren't we winning? I gave you three points that we're going to go into right now so you can understand. I said, first of all, if you want to, to stop losing battles that you should win, conquer the battle of your flesh. Mm -hmm. That's right. That thing, that, that sister girl, that, that anger, that thing that jumps up and steals your uh, control over yourself. Today, we, and we preached that point, so you're going to have to go back and look at last week, but I told you about the flesh, and I told you, and it was, it was a longer message because that is really one of our most mortal enemies. That's one of our, our most deadly enemies is our own flesh. Most of the stuff happens going to happen because of us. God gives us victories and heals us. And then the next point is conquer the battle of your strength. We're going to look at that today. Conquer the battle of your strength. Quit thinking you're stronger than you think you are and understand where your strength comes from. And thirdly, you have to conquer the battle of contentment and start repenting. Don't get contented in your situation. Can we talk about it now? Can we talk about it? Joshua, the background I gave you was Joshua was coming and destroying and he parted the, you know, the uh, Jordan River, and he got his, you know, props from God. He was now the leader. And then chapter 6, uh, after they destroyed Jericho, verse 18, God gave them a covenant condition. In chapter, in verse 18, he told them, keep away from the devoted things. Devoted things. Things that are devoted by the world. Things that the world thinks make you happy. Just because the world said it will bring you happiness doesn't mean it will. Some of us have ruined our whole life by trying to covet things that the world said. And the world got us going around in circles when the reality is our lasting peace happens in the arms, the bosom, and the direction of our God. But he said, when you took it out of the the book said, you not only caused your own destruction, you caused the child to be destructed. Did you know all the destruction can hurt our family, hurt our family? as collateral damage. But God said the whole army fell because of one man's sin. So let's pick it up here. So we found out, how do we conquer this trend? The Bible tells us in verse 2, now, after, after Joshua sent out the men, they said unto Joshua, look, we only need about two or three thousand of us. AI is a small thing. Mm -hmm. You think because it's small, you don't need God. No matter what it is, you still need God. But they said, it's a small thing. So just send a few people up. Then they got, they got real cocky. They said, and you know what? And, and we don't have to let everybody get all worried about it. Send about two or 3,000. So Joshua sent 3,000 men, the Bible said, and the men of Ai smote them. Matter of fact, they killed 36 of them, chased them back. Here's the part I want you to see. And the heart of the people melted because of Ai. Here's what melted me. They had start losing a battle. Their heart was hurt because they thought they should have won. But here's the problem. They were blaming it on God. Can I tell you, if you lose battles, please don't blame it on God. Here is the reality. When you think you're strong, when you think your strength can hold you, when you start believing, because I had a big victory over here, I don't have to pray today, I don't have to read my Bible, you know, I'll wait till Sunday, and then I'll get me some Bible, or, you know, maybe I'll read, you know, uh, I don't feel like reading today. So you spend a day or time without God and wonder what happened to the anointing and the power in your life while you're running around unleashing that beast in you that think it's in control. Here's what happens. Acts 17.28 tells us, it is in him we live and move and have 
our being. Your poets wrote about it. We are his offspring. Listen to that text. It is so powerful. In God we live and rule and have our being. Our poets, the Jewish poet, he was talking about this, has wrote about it, but you need to understand we are his offspring. What's this? In him, that means that we are children of us. Listen, if you do right, 
you will also be accepted. Cain didn't listen to God, and you know what happened to Cain? He lost his birthright. Um, he lost his place. He became infinite. He became lost to darkness. I believe if you struggle long enough being saved, trying to do it yourself, you'll get in the habit of calling up everybody you can find, listening to other people, and not trusting God. And the danger is you're sitting there wondering why your life is so bad. It's because you think you got more strength than you do trusting somebody else. And the other time that's most dangerous, here's the, here's the, here's the extremes. One time you're going through like everything's falling apart. When you don't get God, you may perish. But then there's another time, the most dangerous time, which I think is dangerous than the first time, is when everything is going right. When you got money, you got things, you got stuff, because that's when the enemy comes and tells you, you don't need God. Didn't he tell that to, didn't he tell that to Eve? Uh, has God not said? He you know you'll be like, so we start thinking the stuff and the things, here's the danger, are better than God. On February 1st. 2012. Don Cornelius, a soul train fame. He changed the way soul music and African American movement music is looked at. He syndicated it from 1972 to I mean 1972 to 1991. Soul Train was syndicated as a show that launched many careers. But Don Cornelius had a dark side. He went to his room and got a shotgun. Shot himself and died. His son found him four hours later. When he died, he was worth fifteen million dollars. So he was worth everything. Did you know? The problem was that he truly had a lot of power. The way that it's good, when the way it's good, it's going to come. It's going to happen. But three decades of Don Cornelius' health was going bad. In 1982, he had a 21-hour operation on his brain, brain surgery. 2008, after coping with that and going through a divorce, he went through a period of time where he was locked up for domestic violence and spousal abuse. 2009, he had to pay fines because he had actually stalked her and was whooping her. Here's what happened to Dr. Cornelius. He ran out of power. He didn't get gastric. He took a little bit of his power. You said that this is not going to do it. You said that this is not the best you can get. Because it's only got strength that's going to keep you. And he did it out of by his own hand. I don't know. I don't know how life like closes in when you got fifteen million dollars, a big house, a big car. How does life close in? Because uh, I'm, I, I watch westerns, and, and there's a western called A Man Without a Star. Kurt Douglas was the star of the western, and it lifts me up because in the movie it was talking about Kurt Douglas was this well-known cowboy, and he was mentoring this young guy who wanted to become a real pro, wanted to learn how to shoot, and wanted to learn how to herd cattle, and wanted to learn how to fast draw and ride horses like. He did. And then after he was mentoring him, the man just kept falling apart, falling apart. And he asked him one day, how do you know what to do? Kurt Douglas said to him, see those stars up there? Look at them. God designed every man a star. Pick you one. When you pick that star, follow it. And the young man in the movie Never caught on. That's why it was called a man without a star. See, star is synonymous with God's purpose, God's plan. I believe when you walk around without God's purpose, without God's plan, you walk around without a star. In no direction, you cannot find yourself. Joshua forgot to pray. Joshua listened to everybody but God. Joshua was led astray by the men he listened to. Can I tell you one more? On February the 11th, 2012, 10 days after Don Cornelius, one of the greatest singers in the world, might as well say, took her life. Whitney Houston was found dead in a bathtub with drugs and drug penalty all around her. But here's the thing. She had gone on Oprah. Not long before to give the real deal because she was trying to hide her drug offense. She told Oprah, she said, it was Bobby. Bobby introduced me to drugs. When I got high, I got high with Bobby. Matter of fact, he was my high. I didn't do this by myself. Bobby was the one destroying my life. If I had left him, I'd have been okay. 
That's what she thought. But then Clyde Davis, who was the entertainer responsible for her career, said to Oprah, No, Bobby Moore introduced her to drugs, but Whitney was the one who decided to take it. And when you decide to listen to anything or anybody beside God, you have to bear the results of the fruit that comes from it. So we found out that God wants us to learn we have no power without him. In Colossians 3.3, it tells us that for we are dead and our life is hid in Christ. Your life is hid in Christ. Joshua got on his knees, and here's the next part. God got on his knees and said, Lord, why is all this happening? I, I pity somebody when we begin to whine to God. I want you to see what God did for Joshua so you can see. I, I'm not just signifying because I do it too. All of us have done it. But you know when we begin to whine to God, it's a non effect when God knows that we have the word already in us. He said, hey, God, why have you done this? Did you bring us out here for this? Now, you know better, but you just like, at that point, because your strength is running out, you start blaming God. And then he said, well, he said, no, he said, why? And then he said, you know, they're going to start calling about your name and you didn't let your people. And I like what God said in verse 12. We're going to the last point. Not only must you must conquer thinking you got strength, you got to conquer your contentment and start repenting. Shake your life up. If you think you're good, up and down, back and forth, if you're good, if you're true, 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 if but he went back to the Joshua. And he went back to the Joshua. And he went back to the Joshua. And he went back to the Joshua. It's not me. My people have seen up to the divine thing. They took that curse thing. I like this part. Put it in your possessions. Oh, I'm telling you, it's not that you're sitting a person from God. You're bringing your sins into God's camp. You're not going to be when you're back in your face. How do you bring your God? How do you bring your God? How do you repent? 
He made a confess. Because God knew everything you're going through. But it's not your regular confession. You got to confess your own duty. You know what? I'm talking about your own duty. So I'm going to say, I have to have my miracle done for now. You know what I'm going to do with those other ones? So you cannot do any miracles there because I got proof of life that's important. You got proof of life that's a highlight.
Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did. 